Welcome everybody. It's glad you could be here. A lot going on. It's a very important time, but a very important paper. Uh, Steve Davis and Nick Bloom, Jose Barrow. Um, this is a, uh, a global issue. Jose speaking from Mexico City. Uh, Nick's, I think, right here at Stanford and Nick and Steve's in Chicago. So we're uh, so, so it's such an important topic. I can't believe it. Uh, and they got survey data, so it's real facts and everything. So the title is Why Working From Home Will Stick. It sounds like a pretty affirmative statement, um, but there's lots of data. And I think the, the pattern will be Steve will present, uh, John Cochran and I will ask and monitor, and uh, Nick will chip in and Jose will chip in as well. So go ahead, Steve, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, it's, we're thrilled to be here. It's uh, always a special privilege. So um, let me give you an overview of what, uh, what we'd like to talk about today. Uh, we'll start with some evidence on just the scale of uh, working from home before, during, and after the pandemic. Um, and then we'll turn to some evidence on why uh, we are pretty confident that much of the shift to working from home that's happened um, in the past year will stick. And there's several mechanisms um, in play there. And we've got evidence, not, not complete evidence, but we've got evidence on all the mechanisms that I've listed here. Uh, and we'll talk more about these mechanisms, but they all push in the direction of <clears throat> encouraging a persistent shift uh, to working from home. And then we'll also talk some about uh, consequences. Um, and you know, there are large benefits, we think. They're gonna flow mainly to people like us, people on this call, um, but, they are, but there are benefits uh, more broadly um, there's, big, there's big losses of worker spending in city centers. Um, uh, that's maybe obvious, but there, there are reasons to think they're bigger than you might have guessed. And I'll give you some preliminary numbers on that. Um, and then maybe a, a more subtle issue is we think that um, the shift to working from home will lead to a, a large true increase in productivity that will go mostly unrecorded in conventional productivity statistics. So we'll get into that. <clears throat> the, the main source of our, of our evidence in this talk is, uh, is an original survey of uh, working arrangements and attitudes um, that we designed and that we've been fielding um, since May and monthly since July. Okay, so we've got about uh, 31,000 respondents uh, across nine waves so far. Um, we're going to the field again this month. We're planning to continue this indefinitely because uh, there are a lot of interesting issues that crop up here. Our target population, so this is important to understand who we're after, are US residents aged 20 to 64 and earning, who earned at least 20,000 in 2019, okay? So we're, we're screening out people who are you know, part-time workers, part-year workers uh, that don't earn much. And you might want to think about that in evaluating some of the numbers. <clears throat> uh, in terms of what we do with the sample, we drop speeders. These are people who complete the survey implausibly fast to be consistent with any uh, careful reading of the questions. And after we've done that, we're going to reweight the sample uh, to match the age, sex, education distribution of workers in the CPS. And the reweighting doesn't doesn't change things all that much. So we, you know, we have a sample that's not that far off to start with. We've got 40 uh, to 50 or 60 questions uh, per wave, standard questions on demographics, earnings, hours worked, and then questions about the, how much people are working at home during COVID, during the, the survey week, but also their desires to do so after COVID's over and their employer plans for them uh, after COVID's over, a whole bunch of other questions about uh, uh, perspectives, experience, productivity with working from home, and so on that we'll get into. Here's a sample survey question, okay, and I'm going to show you some evidence from this one uh, on the next slide. So we say after COVID in 2022 and later, how often is your employer planning for you to work full days at home? And um, we allow for people who say their employers never discussed the issue with them. And in that case, we, we assume they won't be working from home and under the view that if, if it's infeasible for them to work from home, then they're not gonna have a conversation with their employer about it. So let me show you the evidence on uh, the scale. 
So the first data point on the left here is from the American Time Use Survey. Um, and that says that about 5% of full paid workdays were performed from home before the pandemic hit. So pretty modest. And that had been slowly creeping up over about 40 years. Okay, so very slow increase over the previous few decades. And then during the pandemic, it rose to well over 40, well over half of all work hours being performed um, were being performed uh, from home during the spring, during the worst of the, of the lockdown and the pandemic. The worst of the lockdown, I guess, not necessarily the worst of the pandemic. Um, things drifted down um, over time and then rose back up again uh, when uh, the pandemic worsened and some jurisdictions reimposed uh, various restrictions on commercial and social activity. And that last data point there is from the survey question I just showed you. And what, what folks say is that their employers plan for them to work about 20% of full work days from home after the pandemic. And kind of the modal response, you think of this way, it's feasible for about half of our respondents to work from home. And among that half, their employers plan for them to work about two days a week per home. Okay, so it's not like there's this huge shift towards working from home, no days to five days a week uh, after the pandemic is over. That happened during the pandemic. That's not the, that's not the modal expectation after things are over. Now, in case you want some confirmation of the survey data, because this is mostly gonna be about survey data, um, you can see uh, rather compelling evidence in equity markets that, uh, that the mar equity markets think the shift to working from home is a big deal. This is from work by uh, Larry Schmidt and Demetrius uh, Papanicolo. Um, and what they do is um, d basically divide, um, sort firms into industries, quartiles uh, defined by whether or not uh, the extent to which their workforce can work from home using the Dingle and Neiman numbers. And basically what happened is in March, um, equity uh, prices diverged uh, sharply um, in the way you would think that firms that were, that could, where a larger share of their workers could work from home um, experienced large gains relative to those who couldn't. And those, those gains have really stuck. They haven't, they haven't uh, diminished. So just, just some external evidence kind of validating what we see in our survey. Now, let's get into why, why we think it'll, it'll stick um, in, in considerable measure. And here I think there's, there's many mechanisms. But we think the most important one is probably uh, well captured by this quotation from the CEO of Morgan Stanley. I'll let you read the quotations, but the key, the key economics is the following. Um, the, the pandemic basically compelled firms and workers to experiment and to experiment at scale with working from home. So you're forced to undertake this massive experiment and to do it at the same time as everybody else is doing it. So you can learn things from the experiment, the, um, the coordination across uh, organizations in that way. And you, you learn some things that, that you wouldn't have chosen to investigate otherwise. Um, and, and here I wanna say there's, there's a little theoretical discussion in the paper, but, but basically it boils down to the following. If you think about there being um, cross-sectional uncertainty uh, across workers and across firms in how well working from home will actually work ex post, then you're gonna get some people in the upper tail of, of the realization distribution. And so you should expect that any large scale compulsory experiment leads to some change in behavior after the experiment's over because some people learn surprisingly good things. In addition, we have evidence that the mean expectation of how well working from home would work um, was negatively biased beforehand, okay? So there's what we call a bias elimination effect. There's both a tail effect and a bias elimination effect. So here's some evidence on, on, on how things turned out thus far working from home during COVID relative to what workers in our survey expected before the pandemic. Okay, that's what you're seeing on this chart. And um, a considerable majority concluded that it worked out better than they expected. And this is, this is asking you in productivity terms. Okay, so we take this as evidence of two things, both of this tail effect is highly relevant, but also there's a bias elimination effect in play 
because on balance, these numbers are sharply to the positive side. Okay, so that's the first, first mechanism. Now you might ask, do these productivity surprises as revealed in the data I just summarized, um, correlate with plans and desires to work from home after the pandemic? And the answer is yes, they do. And the effects are pretty big as you can see um, on this chart. So on the vertical scale, I've got percent of working days that are either planned or desired to be working from home after the pandemic. And then on the horizontal scale, I've got the size of the productivity surprise, okay? And you can see there's, that there's clear evidence here, at least uh, in what people tell us in the survey, that the surprises they've experienced in working from home will affect both their desires and their actual behavior after the pandemic's over. Now, a second mechanism um, that we can partly quantify um, is investments to enable working from home. So in our survey, we ask, among other things, uh, how many hours respondents um, have invested in learning how to work from home effectively, um, and how much money they or their employers have spent on equipment to help them work effectively at home. This is equipment at home. This is not equipment in the office or in the cloud. Um, and so you see the numbers there. It's about 14 hours, $600 uh, per person. When we value time at people's wage, we come up with a uh, mean dollar equivalent investment of about $1,500 per person uh, per respondent in our survey, okay? And that's in 2020, that's from, from April or May, May to December. So that, that works out to about 1.2% well, of annual labor income and, and uh, uh, nearly three quarters of a percent of a year's worth of GDP. So that's a pretty big investment number, especially when you think about the, the normally uh, sharply pro-cyclical nature of investment. Now we can't get so directly at the investments that are happening on employer premises and by employers in the cloud. But if you look at NIPA data, you get some clue that something similar is happening um, there as well. So there's a NIPA category for investment in information processing equipment and software. And that rose from 2019 to the second and third quarters of, of uh, 2020 by a few tenths of a percent of GDP, even as the rest of investment um, as a share of GDP fell pretty su substantially, which is kind of the usual cyclical pattern. So this, this 0.7, percent figures is probably an understatement. But what you take away from it is there's that workers and employers are much better positioned to work from home effectively after the pandemic's over than before it struck. So that's another source of stickiness. Next two sources I want to talk about are, are about attitudes. And one thing is there's been a huge shift in attitudes uh, according to what we according to what people tell us on the survey. And we basically ask them about their uh, perceptions of how working from home is viewed um, by people they know, okay? It's, it's a kind of deliberately vague term. We're trying to get a sense of whomever they think is the relevant group um, that holds perceptions that might in turn affect their own views and their own behavior. And the bottom line here is there's been an enormous um, decline, almost an erasure of the stigma associated with working from home. You know, we don't know how much of that will stick after the pandemic's over, we think some of it will, but what it says is that uh, both employers and employees will no longer see as much stigma associated with not working in the office. So that's another effect that cuts in the direction of more working from home. There's also a different attitudinal effect. We ask them, we ask people, and, and here I'm showing you the question that we posed to them before December, 2020. Uh, since we've got good news on the vaccine front, we've started modifying this question to ask them things like, you know, now that a COVID vaccine is available and being deployed, and, and you know, what when it's widely deployed, what would fit your views? That about the, you know, about your about your concerns about mingling with others or sharing elevators with others and that type of thing. I won't go through the details here, but the 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 thrust of this slide is 
that um, only a minority of people, roughly a quarter, says they'll basically go back to living their lives as they used to live it um, before the pandemic. The rest express, you know, some moderate or 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 considerable aversion uh, to mingling and uh, proximity to others that will continue even after the pandemic's over. Now, again, you know, we don't know whether these survey responses will correspond to actual behavior fully, but I think it's reasonable to conclude that to a substantial extent that they, they will, uh, and hence people are going to desire to be a, on average a little more distant from others in restaurants, uh, in their workplaces, in subways, uh, buses, and so on. So again, that's another factor that pushes uh, towards the persistence of the shift to working from home. And then Nick and I have another um, <clears throat> another short paper with um, Yulia Jeskova, who just just um, took a job to join Goldman Sachs. And what we do there is we basically use automated readings of the text in newly filed patent applications. Okay, you can get these weekly uh, from the U.S. Patent and Trade Office. You can you can download them, scrape them, uh, clean out all the junk, and then you can define a, a basically a dictionary of terms that allows you to identify those new patent applications. These are applications, not completed, not, not necessarily patents that are granted, patent applications that advance technologies that support working from home. And you can see what that was a basically noisy but flat before the pandemic. Um, and since the pandemic struck, the share of new patent applications that fits our bucket of what advances working from home technologies has doubled. And so we think of that as kind of a um, pandemic-induced redirection of technical change of the sort that will make working from home and remote interactivity more generally get better and better in the coming months and years. And of course, that will also encourage uh, more working from home. So that's some evidence on why we think it will stick. And um, let me turn Let me turn now to... Um, um, nobody, nobody's asked me any questions yet. I've, everybody's hearing me fine. Actually, there, there's a couple of questions uh, from uh, Tyler and Jonathan. Okay, why don't we take those before we'll take I go? The, take those two. And uh, of course, we all have millions of questions, but go ahead. Tyler, it's Jonathan. Well, let me, I mean, my big concern is the accuracy of the answers. I mean, obviously, I'm the worst offender of this. If I like something, then my, I changed my views to come into, uh, uh, so that they, they validate what I like. So if I like working from home, then I'm going to say I'm hugely productive at home. But the question is not whether I think I'm productive, but whether my employer thinks I'm productive. Did you do anything to look at that? Yeah, we did a couple of things. One, we asked people not just about whether they want to work from home, but whether their employer plans for them to work from home. But second, more directly, I'm, I'm going to show you two different productivity measures, one of which relies on self-assessed self effic relative efficiency when working from home, and one which uh, circumvents any, any self-assessment of how efficient I am. So I've got, and, and both, both approaches, this, this is coming up, both approaches yield big, big productivity gains as a consequence of the shift to working from home. So, so I'll get to that here uh, under the under the consequences section. But we did we did try to be sensitive to that. Uh, Jonathan, just quickly, the other thing we we're not really mentioning it today, but Jose, Steve, and I are working with the Atlanta Fed. There's this monthly survey of firms, so we're serving employers rather than individuals. And we've also asked them what's their plans post pandemic for working from home, and if you take their numbers, it's also about twenty percent. So it turns out if you ask employers, it aligns almost perfectly. It, that's just one cross tab, but I think from the employer side, it lines up pretty well. Thanks. Tyler, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, going back a few slides, it looked like the uh, productivity surprises were, were relative to um, expectations. So I was just wondering how the absolute level of productivity compared. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you that too. 
I'll show you that too. And then okay. those the previews, those are also balanced to the upside, but not as much. Okay, okay but but we'll I'll, I'll show you those data and, and I'll make use of those data in, in answering the the, issue, the question Jonathan asked. Great, thanks. Uh, Axel Merck, quick question. Axel? Sure. Well, it's somewhat of a comment, but I can rephrase it as a question, maybe. Um, just to talking as a kind of small business employer, to me, you, you quoted Morgan Stanley, the more rigid an institution is, uh, Morgan Stanley, for example, they have very narrowly defined processes. So ripping people out of that working from home is, is kind of chronically painful, whereas a Silicon Valley firm tends to be more flexible to begin with. And to me, it appears to be that a lot of it depends on the design, on the workflows that, that these businesses have and what they're willing to do. A large bank is not going to be willing to redo their payment processes, many of the processes they have, and they want to get everybody back. Whereas, of course, um, if you are a more flexible organization, notably a small organization, you might invest heavily to make employees happy and productive through some sort of hybrid model. And when I look at these expenses that you show for, um, oh, you spent X dollars to give them whatever, a, a chair to work at home, um, just talking about our own small business, right? We've done that, of course, but then we're spending fairly substantial amounts during the year to make a post-COVID hybrid model successful. And I'm just wondering, to rephrase that as a question, um, how how can one measure that as, in terms of questions and, and factor those sort of considerations in, into a model? Oh yeah, so there's, there's no doubt that what you said is true. And you know, I've been mostly focusing on mean outcomes and conditional means um, in the interest of time, but there is enormous um, heterogeneity. Um, a, say, look, look, since I have data on workers, I'll speak to that first. There's enormous, uh, you can look across all demographic groups, the, all the standard demographic groups, and you see within each group, on average, there's considerable desires to work from home. Um, but there's also enormous variation within groups. There's, there's a lot of people who hate to work from home. And there's some people who would love to work from home five days a week. But then, as I said earlier, the, the modal view is um, on, on both the desired side, but also on the plan side is, to, is the hybrid model you described. And I'll, I also agree there's, you know, there's enormous challenges for firms to make that hybrid model work. Uh, so, uh, Hats off to you if you can execute well on that. That's like the, uh, you know, the hundred billion dollar question uh, for businesses these days is is how to make a how to make the hybrid model work. Um, and uh, you know we're we're not going to get too far down that path in this discussion, but it's a huge issue. Uh, John Cochran, I just want to ask the obvious microeconomics question. Um, we always thought that <laughs> work at home had to be piecework, and in fact. There used to be lots of work at home. Uh, you know, you would sew things and, and you get paid by the sweater. Uh, and that salaried employees had to go in because we had to monitor them. Now, <clears throat> maybe the, the nature of a lot of technology, technology work allows monitoring even when they're not, you can, you, you can measure, are they, you know, producing enough websites or whatever they're doing, not just goofing off on the internet all day long. Conversely, a lot of what I hear about the office from, you know, friends who used to be at Goldman Sachs, is that you'd go into the office and you stay there until the boss was there just to show who's tough, uh, even though you weren't getting anything done. <laughs> uh, and somehow those, uh, if you're gonna work at home, you have to substitute somehow for those dynamics to show, to, I guess if you answer emails at midnight, then you're, uh, you're tough. But more importantly, the first question, isn't there a worry about, uh, you know, how, how do you monitor and measure work at home? Or is it just the technology now allows that? Well, the two things, there, there, even before COVID, there was uh, a big increase in uh, monitoring technologies. I invite you to Google on uh, employee monitoring software. I think you'll find you get at least a couple hundred million hits. Um, so, so there's been improvements in that respect. But the other, the other thing to say here, John, is there are people like you and me who get paid not on inputs, but on outputs. And the outputs I are often hard to define. Um, and if you're getting paid on an output model, um, not a piece rate model, but like, but just, you know, some, you know, how many great papers have you produced in the last year, uh, or great op-eds have you written? 
you know, you don't need to monitor people's inputs on a minute by minute basis uh, for that. And so I think there's also been, you also got to think about the character of the work that's being performed and the nature of the jobs. What, what I skipped over in my, uh, in the stuff so far is there's huge differences um, by education and earnings in what employers plan for their workers to do after the pandemic. And as you move up into the high, uh, highly educated, high earners who are less likely to be doing the kind of work that can be subject to piece rate measurement, um, that's when you see the biggest increases in employer plans. So I think part of the answer to your question is, as you suggested, better monitoring technologies. But part of it is the nature of work for some people doesn't involve close monitoring of inputs or even piece rate outputs anyway. So there should be some great heterogeneity predictions here that people who work in teams where it's hard to measure your individual contribution, they're going to be going back to the office. People who it's, you know, you have to process 60 uh, applications today. Well, then we know how many you did. So yeah, that's uh, a good, that's a good point. And, and we should, we should think about um, asking more questions about the nature of the tasks that people perform so that we can test some of those yeah. uh, predictions. What kinds of things go on? Yep. So uh, there's a few more questions. Maybe we should go on uh, and uh, hear a little bit more. I, I'd say one, just if I interject, I see Pete Wilson is here and there are questions about not working from home, but working from other states, uh, which is on our mind here in California a lot. So. Don't forget that, but anyway, go ahead, Steve. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about consequences and then we'll open it up to questions. And basically, uh, you know, I'll, be, I'm, uh, I'll talk about consequences. I'll have a slide on messages for policy and then we can just have a free form discussion. So um, th this is related to something I was just saying to John um, and, and Jonathan as, as, as well. Um, it, here I'm just showing you some of the heterogeneity uh, in employer plans for post COVID working from home. So on the vertical scale here, I've got numbers of paid work, full paid work days from home. And then I'm showing you desires, which is I hinted earlier are remarkably prevalent across all demographic groups we've looked at including earnings, earnings buckets, which is what I'm showing you here. Um, basically, people want to work from home about two days a week. That's the average. And that's true for high income people. It's true for middle income people, low income people. But when you turn to what employers plan, uh, the, the plans are well aligned with desires only at the top end of the earnings distribution. Okay. Um, and so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind when you start thinking about who's, who's actually going to benefit. Uh, in, in the form of their desires being realized. Um, part of the reason that um, higher earners express a greater desire to work from home is they have longer commutes, except at the very top end. Um, that was a little bit of a surprise to me, um, but there's a pretty strong pattern here. So this is the average one-way commute length, and it's basically uh, twice as much at the top of the distribution or the not the very top, but next to the top, people earn say $200,000 a year, um, but twice as high there as for people at the bottom of our earnings distribution, which is $20,000 um, per year. So um, we can put these things together um, along with um, two other questions that I've got to the right side of this slide, and we can actually quantify the benefits that will be uh, realized by the post COVID shift to working from home and as a percent of earnings and their distribution across different groups. So let me tell you a bit about how we do that. Um, so we ask people uh, first, you know, how would you, how would you feel about working from home two or three days a week after the pandemic's over? And if they're neutral, then we don't ask them another question, but if they say I would like it or I wouldn't like it, then we ask them a follow-up question that basically invites them to quantify the value of the option to work from home two or three days a week, okay? Um, so we use those numbers 
uh, to generate what's called the perk value of the option to work from home two or three days a week. Okay, and so that's what you see on the right. And you can see those numbers are big. They're big across the board. They're especially large at the top end of the earnings distribution. Then we take those numbers and we multiply them by zero if their employer doesn't plan for them to work from home at least one day a week. We multiply them by a half if their employer says they can work from home one day a week. And we multiply them by one if their employers plan for them to work from home two or more days a week. That's how we generate the left column here, the value of plans post COVID working from home. So it's a, you know, it's a reasonably crude approach, but nonetheless, the numbers here are big enough and the patterns are striking enough that it still something very clear comes out, which is people in the upper brackets of the earnings distribution are going to get huge um, implied gains from the employer plans for them to shift from home. Uh, whereas at the lower end of the earnings distribution, those gains are pretty small. Now, to be, to be careful here, I should say that I, what we're measuring here, what we're, what we're estimating is the amount of surplus that's generated. Um, and I'd need to write down a model that specified the structural characteristics of the labor market uh, and, the, and the wage bargaining process to determine exactly how that surplus was split uh, between the employer and the employee but anything close to a Nash bargaining model, which seems like a reasonable benchmark, you know, where each party gets about half, uh, is going to lead to the conclusion that there are big, big gains um, at the top end and much more modest gains at the bottom end of the earnings distribution. Just con continuing with, with that same theme, uh, you can see that there's also a steep gradient with respect to education here. Um, there's also bigger gains for men than women, not because they have higher value of working from home. It's just that they tend to be in the kinds of jobs that are more likely to lend themselves to working from home. And so their employers uh, plan for them to work from home at a higher pace. So that's, so I think that's the, so there's a, there's a real piece of good news here in our view, which is the shift to working from home involves very large benefits as expressed by the respondents themselves. Now I'm gonna show you there's very large benefits in another way, not from what people tell us, but from what, you know, what happens to their compute, commuting time. Okay, so as you, as you probably guessed, there is a big savings commuting time. Let me just start with a ballpark calculation. Um, and I, I won't run through the details here, this is pretty straightforward, but the numbers are huge, you know, according to our, our ballpark estimates, um, commuting times fallen by about 1.3 billion hours per month since the pandemic started. And, and we project that it'll be about uh, 440 million hours per month lower after the pandemic than it was before the pandemic. So these are big numbers, but we wanna translate them into something, uh, something more meaningful. So let's do that. I'm, gonna, I'm going to express them shortly in terms of an implied productivity gain. But before I, and you can already guess where this is going, but before I do that, I wanna put two more facts on the table um, that will help you understand why the, why the gains that we're going to estimate are so large um, and why the revenue effects, why the sales revenue effects in uh, urban areas are, are large. So <clears throat> on the left-hand side here, um, I've shown you average weekly expenditures per person near their work site. And I've shown you a bin scatter plot of that against population density in the vicinity of their work site. Okay. And which the key thing to see here is that average weekly spending, and this is things like, you know, food at restaurants, coffee shops, personal services entertainment venues and just general shopping that you do where in the, in, in, in the close proximity of your employer. So we ask questions about that. Um, and then you can see that those numbers rise sharply with uh, the population density in the vicinity of the employer work site. And then on the right side, what you see is the employer plans for the fraction of full work days to be performed from home as a function of population density in the vicinity of the work site. 
And there you see a very strong relationship. So the shift to working from home will be concentrated. It will, will, will have a bigger effect on, uh, on work sites located in uh, densely populated areas. And those are the same areas in which people tend to spend more when they commute into work. So anyway, we, we're in the process of taking those numbers and translating them into a, uh, what we think of as a, as a, good, a good estimate of what the, uh, what the spending drop will be, but we haven't fully implemented that. So I'm just gonna show you today a, simpler, a simple calculation for Manhattan. And this simple calculation misses some of the cross-sectional patterns that I just showed you, but let me, let me walk you through it and you'll see we already get a big number. So we got an, our data set's large enough that we can just calculate something directly for Manhattan. It's got a large enough number of commuters. So inward commuters spent um, about $304 a week near their workplaces before COVID. These are inward commuters to Manhattan. Um, according to our data, their employers plan for them to spend about 34% of their workdays from home after COVID. Manhattan had 2.3 million net daily inward commuters uh, in 2019. So you can put those numbers together. You can calculate an annual spending drop of works out to about 11 billion or about 12% of 2019 taxable sales in Manhattan. If you do the analogous calculation for San Francisco, it's 4%. Now you can see that there's obviously going to be some impact on sales revenues and uh, 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 sales tax revenues. Um, I wanna point out two things that we're missing so far in these calculations. First, the simple calculation that I just did doesn't capture the cross-sectional correlation between spending near workplaces and the size of the shift to working from home. And I already showed you there's a positive correlation there. So in, in, in the sense that these numbers that I, the 12% number for Manhattan and the 4% number for San Francisco are too small. They'll get bigger once I do the micro-based calculation. The, the other thing to note is these are um, for all of Manhattan or all of San Francisco. And obviously the, the effects on sales in the vicinity of say, the main commercial centers in San Francisco and Manhattan will be much larger than these numbers uh, because we're not, we're not uh, calculating intra uh, area commuting nor are we really getting the concentration around a few zip codes. Um, we we uh, will we'll try to do that if we have enough, uh, if we have enough granularity in our data. So let me, um, I got, one more topic, and then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna stop, which is the productivity gain. So let me let me talk about that, and then we'll we'll just have a free form of questions. First, we can calculate. We can use our data to, to directly calculate an implied gain from less commuting. So let me show you how we do that. These will be one of the productivity gain calculations I do. I'm also going to do a calculation that relies directly on self-assessed. Um, Productivity differentials, uh, and obviously, you know these these two approaches have different strengths and weaknesses. So, we ask people about what their employers plan for them to work from home after the pandemic. Um, we can estimate how much they work from home before the pandemic. We ask them their daily round trip commute time, that's C, and we also ask them what fraction of their commute time they devote to work related activities. So we're going to adjust for that as well. So that top equation is just the time savings for person I in our sample. Okay. Now we can calculate um, a, an implied productivity gain arising just from the time savings in commuting. And that's what is shown on the middle, uh, middle slide. Okay. So the denominator there in the, on the right of that middle equation that's total time devoted to work, inclusive of commuting time, okay? And then the numerator is the time savings piece, okay? So all, all I'm calculating here, conceptually it's very simple, is what's the uh, implied productivity gain, uh, labor productivity in percentage terms that just comes from the savings in commuting time. So that will be one of the productivity calculations I do. 
Um, the other productivity calculation makes use of workers self-assessed um, efficiency when working from home relative to the office, okay? And here you can see, as I suggested earlier, um, that um, the, on the balance of this distribution is to the positive side, okay? So on average, workers think they're more efficient when they're working from home. If they say they are more efficient when they're working from home, we then follow up with questions to say, did you include the time savings um, as a source of the efficiency gain that you reported to us? And the vast majority say yes. And if they do, if they do say yes, we also ask them, well, how much of this efficiency gain do you, do, um, that you reported to us is due to the time savings from less commuting? So these give me all the ingredients I need now to construct um, two different measures of two different estimates of the true productivity gain from more working from home after the pandemic than we had before the pandemic. So the first calculation I did, the one that makes use of the commuting data and not the self-assessed productivity, gives about a 6% productivity boost on an equal weighted basis and 8.5% boost on an earnings weighted basis. Those are very large numbers. If I make use of the self-assessed productivity numbers, uh, then I get somewhat smaller numbers, 4.5% and 6% on an earnings weighted basis. And by the way, people also attribute when we ask them directly, you know, where are, your, where are these productivity gains coming from that you see from working from home? The vast majority of those gains, as you can see in these numbers, are, are coming, are, well, you can't quite see yet, but I'm, I'll tell you, they're coming from, in their own assessment, they're also coming from the, the time savings. So we think this is really, really good news, um, a very big positive benefit here measured in productivity terms, but most of this productivity boost will be missed in conventional measures of productivity uh, because conventional measures don't encompass the time spent commuting, okay? And so if we take the same data and we calculate an estimate of how much of a productivity boost there will be as it's conventionally measured by the BLS or the BEA, we get numbers like 1% instead of numbers like 6 to 8%, okay? So that's obviously a big discrepancy. And then uh, this is my last slide. I will perhaps let people review it and then start just take a bunch of questions. I know there's a bunch in yeah, the there's, order. There's oh. quite, a, quite a few already. So uh, let's go down the... So Elena Pastorino has a question. Uh, we'll go down the list. El Elena? Thank you, John. And thank you, Steve, for the presentation. I have a couple of questions about, I would say, economies of, sco of scale and densities. So I'm thinking about the stage of the generation of diffusions of ideas within an organization and ideally an economy. And we know that many of these models emphasize the importance of the scale of the pools through which people meet, like Lucas and Buera have even ever view on this. So the sense, I don't know if it is a fair question, but what is your sense of the uh, size of the productivity, dynamic productivity gains that we are losing because of the, uh, the fact that we no longer are together, literally as these models would say, bouncing off ideas um, uh, with each other. And the second related point, if the, the trade-off of commuting. So we know that people can stay home safe on commuting, but there's an incentive to since you don't have to go back to your office and drive all day as you used to, to live farther away from where uh, your office is physically located. And so the question, what's the danger? The second question of diluting economies of densities, which we know are important for urban level productivity. Thank you. Sure, thanks for the questions. Two things. First, I'm not so sure that the, uh, the, the density effects are gonna be negative. Um, and that's because there's an offsetting effect. And it's kind of, it's illustrated by this workshop. I, I suspect this workshop now draws from a larger geographic domain than it did before COVID. That's true. And, and I'd also venture to say that will continue afterwards. So I personally know that I'm struggling, maybe some of you are struggling with, now that there are all these great workshops around the world uh, that I can go to, 
um, you know, maybe I don't need to go to quite as many at my campus. So there's going to be a productivity loss uh, um, in my interactions with my immediate colleagues, but there's also a, a greater diffusion of ideas on a broader geographic scale. So I think the jury's out as to whether this COVID induced shift towards more remote interactivity will increase or decrease the dynamic generation of ideas that come through interactions. I think that it's a great question. Um, I think it's a very complex one and I'm not, I don't feel confident that uh, about even, even what the sign, sign of the uh, effect will be. So I think there's lots of work to be done there. Um, on the second one, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of economies of scale associated with cities. There's also a lot of diseconomies. Um, so, uh, you know, again, the, the, it's a complex set of issues, but I feel reasonably confident in saying that if the technology for remote interactivity gets better, and I think it has gotten better, partly as a consequence of COVID, and it will continue to get better uh, for the because of the, the redirection of technical change, that should alter the, um, the uh, equilibrium and, and the optimal um, extent of physical agglomeration. And you know, again, it's back to this issue to some extent, um, we can substitute physical agglomeration with uh, agglomeration in, in, uh, in the ether space here. So I, you know, these are very complex issues. Uh, and uh, we're we're not we're not addressing them in this paper, um, uh, but I do think this paper uh, should you know, stimulate even greater interest in those questions than they already had. Uh, Greg Hess has a question. Greg, it's there? more of an observation, Steve, uh, and it just has to do with age. Uh, what we're finding at our organization that that very you know new workers. Uh, are very keen to get back in the office. Uh, they have small apartments. They don't have marginal space or unused bedrooms from children who've left the nest. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they are very keen to get back in the office. You know, uh, we're also finding that those who are, uh, ha are empty nesters are also keen to get back uh, into the office, but there's, there's kind of a, a, a donut hole a little bit in the middle. Uh, and in particular, you know, young workers really feel that there's a huge value to networking, not just for teamwork, which oftentimes they're put in the middle of teams because, you know, they're, they're junior workers and they can't really be trusted for, for you know, the, the ultimate product. But they're, they're also very wary that, you know, they're also very cognizant that if they want to move up in the world, they've, they've learned all these things about how they're supposed to be networking mm -hmm. and, and kind of the immediate effects of networking means they got to be close to people um, who, who, um, who, 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 who can give them a positive trajectory. But it, it, great work, by the way. And we're, no, we, we're, we, thanks for that. We see those patterns in the data. I didn't have time yeah. to show it, but we see right. exactly the patterns you, discuss, you described. Exactly. Yeah. The young single people, they, they're, they're more eager to get back to home and so are old empty nesters. Um, so we, we definitely see those patterns in the data. Okay, Bob Hall, Bob? You can see I'm sitting here with my wife and, and she of course reminds everyone of the saying, uh, I love you for better, for worse, but not for lunch. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, but my, my, my comment uh, relates to this interesting point that that both sides seem to favor the hybrid two or three days. But that has the striking implication that the employer either has to have space that's vacant, desks that are unused, workstations that are unused, um, as opposed to uh, having all or nothing rule, in which case uh, they could scale back on phys physical facilities, or they have to come up with some fancy way so that, that people stagger over time to use uh, a, a workstation. So, or I know that there's some companies that are have a system where you, when when you arrive for work, you pull a chit, and the chit tells you a, which of many. You know, it's like calling an Uber instead of calling an Uber, you call a desk. Uh, but I think it's a real problem. I, you know, it, 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 it interests me that that it's so popular. Uh, but the the number of office towers uh, is is really going to be strongly affected by the solution to this problem. Agreed. I mean, um, it is, there are, lot, there are lots of anecdotal um, discussions of just this issue. And um, 
I think a lot of managers are groping, uh, trying to figure out what is the right solution for their company. And I'm, I imagine the groping process will go on for quite some time. And as you pointed out, the, the modal solution that office-oriented com office companies gravitate towards too will have a big impact on the demand for commercial space and how the commercial space is, is structured. Bob, happy to take the question. I've, this, this survey, we've also been talking to huge numbers of execs, uh, like mass, hey Susan, so ma massive execs, like a, I mean, I don't know, dozens and dozens of them. So one thing that comes up is for small firms, I think you're right, they're probably going to have office space empty. The kind of the overwhelming sense is mixed mode is a disaster. So when like four people are in the office and two are at home on Zoom, people really hate that for a, you know, a list of reasons. So I think for small firms, they just all come in on the same three days, like Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. The bigger firms, they break it up into teams. And then you do have this more complicated rotation. So, you know, the commercial teams on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, week one, and Wednesday, Friday, week two, and then the residentials on the other way around. The other issue that lots of, I spoke to quite a lot of fund managers, and in fact, three or four companies are into retail investment, sorry, residential and commercial investment. I, you're entirely right, skyscrapers are cursed. They're like the worst high rises because you have the double curse of how do you get people to the front door of mass transit? And then once you're at mass transit, how do you get to the top of it? Like I spoke to a firm that's in Salesforce Tower. They have several floors there earlier in the year. And they said, like, I haven't been in the office and I'm not sure what we're ever going to do with that space again. So I think a lot of those buildings are going to have to dramatically de-densify, convert some of the floors to residential. You know, one, one firm I spoke to had a fantastic applied micro so a microeconomics idea about charging for elevator time because the big problem for skyscrapers is elevators on the way up between 8 30 and 9 and down between 4 30 and 5 and they said why don't we just slash our rental rates for the space by 50 percent but say charge people a dollar to go up in the mornings and down in the evenings it's like airline pricing in fact you've got a serious peak load problem and it's less about the office space but you're right so ned, ned prescott has a question ned it really wasn't a question, more of a comment. And when okay. Steve calculations about the decline in spending and commuter in the big commuter locations, that's going to get reallocated to, um, you know, where you, where you're working at home in the, the local community. I sure. mean, I certainly do that, you know, get out, I got to get out of the house. So it was more of a comment rather than a question, but, but more oh, generally it seems to be moving a little bit away from a Tibu equilibrium to a little bit more of a Valraisian equilibrium where you can choose your, by your location. Because if you can, you know, to the extent you can work. Okay. Yeah, your, your point about the reallocation is exactly right. But of course, you know, reallocation involves adjustment costs and frictions, and it can be done, it can be done slowly or quickly, it can be done in facilitated by government authorities or retarded by government authorities. So um, there, there are a lot of big important policy issues, I think, actually, uh, tied to that kind of reallocation and to what Nick was saying. And what Bob Hall was mentioning, you know, the repurposing of commercial and, and residential space in urban areas. Um, I think you know, whether that do, gets done efficiently or inefficiently is, is going to have a huge impact on the, the medium term um, economic health of cities. So I see uh, Pete Wilson has a question, Pete. Yeah, I think Nick Bloom made a very interesting point. And I also think that if your survey, which I think you've done excellent work, but if you had, instead of using San Francisco and Manhattan, if you had included Los Angeles, you would have gotten, I think, an even more violent reaction from the people who are so sick of spending hours stuck in congestion. Most of them either take up audio books or listen to some favorite commentator if they can. But otherwise, it's almost a pure waste. Maybe some listen to music, I don't know. I, I listened to audio books when I was doing that and for some years was commuting downtown, but from the near, the near west side. But I, I've got to tell you that when I changed offices to Century City, and was just minutes away, I still preferred, I, I will put it this way, 
I think work from home is going to stick uh, for a lot of people from reasons that have already been cited. But I think that the congestion and particularly with women, whether they're working women who have to go home to a family or whether they're empty nesters who don't, but still do drive to different places. They are the ones that I keep hearing celebrating as the one thing that they really prize. They don't, they don't I think Bob all was right. I've met every one of the, at least half of the people responding here have heard their wives say not for lunch. But what I do think is that the women themselves have, are even more appreciative of, uh, of the drop in congestion. And I think that's a major factor in, uh, in people who are owners of office buildings. Uh, I think next comment that they're going to have to be the people that figure out another way to use that space. And it may just be that they will use it to live there. And that's happening uh, I don't know, in Beijing, the top half of the World Trade Center uh, are offices, but the bottom half are homes. Yep. Well, thank you. I, I, I pretty much agree with everything you said. Uh, the, and, and especially at the end, the, you know, the need to repurpose space in urban areas is, is critical. And uh, the other thing, we'll, we'll, we'll get LA into the next draft. <laughs> we'll, we'll do some calculations for LA. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark Schoberg, Mark? Yeah, I know you did a few iterations of the survey over time, um, you know, dating back to kind of early in the pandemic to, 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 to more recently as things have extended. And I'm curious if there's been any trends that you've seen and changes in sentiment around um, you know, either the desire or plan to work from home, um, one, or in kind of views on productivity as well. Well, as Nick mentioned earlier, um, desires have been going up. Desired work time, post-pandemic desires have been trending up a little bit in our survey, big enough that we can detect some statistically significant differences. Most other things are, are reasonably uh, uh, stable over time. Maybe Jose knows, but I don't think, at least I haven't looked at how the productivity calculations, um, whether they have varied um, in an important way over time. But most of the stuff's reasonably stable. I've been struck actually by how stable it is. As Steve said, the only thing that really has trended was people's desire to work from home. It's surprising it's gone up. I thought people would be fed up with it, but in reverse, it's rising. But if you go back to commentary, like last May and June, when I talked to firms there, the view has hardly changed. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg spoke openly last May about Facebook, for example, and it, it's almost totally static about, we'll go back to the office, but not full time. I mean, the, the other thing that's, Depressingly, has also stated is how long we think the pandemic's going to take <laughs> to play out. I mean, you know, now when I talk to execs, they're still saying six months before we even begin to return to the office a year until we fully return. It's like Brexit. Uh, it just never seems to end. I mean, it's just, uh, so I think we're still about a year at least away from any form of equilibrium whereby we're going to get to the post state actually, which is another issue. A lot of firms are worried about how you get from here to the it's interesting because you know, anecdotally, you hear, you know, younger workers seeming to have more of a realization that they're missing that mentorship element of being at work. You know, it's kind of one thing that seems to have evolved. You hear more about you know Zoom fatigue and some of those challenges. Where you know, at the same time, there's probably new innovations that make you know working from home a little easier. So it's interesting to see how those are comparing. Yeah. So I just checked. Uh... The, the productivity statistics. So productivity relative to expectations and, and your productivity relative to working on business premises. And basically the trend is more or less a little bit noisy, but kind of flat through, through our survey rate. So, so, and then that, that fits my recollection and what Steve said. Uh, so benefits of having your computer in front of you while you're giving the seminar. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mike Bosco has a question, Mike. Yeah, yeah they're, they're kind of related uh, and also 
I would just emphasize that I'm not sure you can generalize from this episode to what life will be like five years from now. Maybe divorce rates will be up, who knows. Um, but uh, so uh, do it again in a few years, what I'm suggesting. Um, second point is there's a vast literature on the value of time. Um, and the BEA also has substantial numbers of satellite accounts that try to value in various ways um, many of the things that aren't included in the traditional statistics. Have you looked at those and how they compare to your estimates? We haven't looked at them directly, but but you know the one of the themes that comes out of that literature, as I understand it, is one of the least enjoyable aspects of people's days commuting. So we 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 valued people's time at their market wage. If we were to put a premium on top of that because they really hate commuting, then we get even bigger numbers than what I showed. So that, that may be, be given taxes, that may be a reasonable value of the social cost, but the private cost generally comes out to something like about a half their wage. Uh, partly because of things Pete Wilson mentioned, they do other, they've learned to adapt and do other things in their car. Well, okay, the so, tax, et cetera. You know, we, in any event, it's just, it, it would just be useful yeah. to take a look at that, I think, for you guys to- For sure. External yeah. comparison for something that's kind of out there in the literature and is used in government. Agreed. Agreed. I just, I want to know, we've, we've got one of those offsets in there already. Um, so if they, to the extent that they're devoting time in their commute to work, we don't count that. We take that out and we've asked them about that. But, but I understood we could do more. We could do more to, to connect to that literature. Uh, Sebastian Edwards. Sebastian. Uh, thanks, John. Great paper. I, uh, it seems to me, uh, Steve and Nick and Jose, from the, uh, uh, what you guys have found, that there will be profound income distribution effects here. Uh, everyone wants to work from home more or less the same number of days, and, uh, but only the high income people will actually get to do it. Have you guys thought about the political ramification of all of this? I mean, greater segregation in the in the urban space and and uh, yeah, agglomeration of different classes. I mean, going back to what Pete Wilson says, here in LA, you see the number of people that are um, uh, commuting. Um, most of them are in the service industry. These are gardeners and construction workers that cannot work from home. So how, how do you guys think of all of this? Well, two, two things. First, I, I want to emphasize that we do find benefits across the board. OK, so I, it, this is not a story of you know, the things are going to get better for the high income and worse for the low income. It's a story that they're going to get better broadly, but the, dis, the benefits are going mainly to the higher earners. Second, you know. I could imagine how this would be good at the low end of the distribution if a larger number of low earners are able to live closer to where they work because the high earners are now more dispersed in where they work. Okay. So, you know, we need fewer Starbucks in uh, downtown San Francisco and maybe more Starbucks in the, uh, in the outlying areas that are, um, sources of inward commuting to San Francisco. So I, but obviously there's a lot of, there's a lot of complex general equilibrium interactions here um, that, that will be in play in determining the income distribution. And I think based on the data that I've shown you today, it's hard to get more than just a first kind of a directional effect. So it's an important issue. Um, and I, I guess one more thing, I, what I worry about on the political side is poorly run cities that don't facilitate the kind of repurposing of commercial, residential, and public space, the, the repurposing that's needed to respond effectively um, to the changes induced by the pandemic and by working from home. And there's a lot of poor, there's a lot of low income people who live in those cities. Uh, and so I think, you know, the one thing we, if, if we can make sure that there's an expeditious repurposing of space in urban areas, 
that will have a lot of benefits to lower income people. So I think that's a very important policy message. It's not a, it's not a concrete policy action proposal, but it does put the spotlight not on the big macroeconomic policy issues that attract so much attention, but really a lot of the attention uh, needs to be on kind of ground level business permitting, zoning uh, regulations, uh, state level land use regulations, all that stuff's gonna be really important in my view. I, I think you described uh, Los Angeles in the poor run city uh, that is going to impede all the uh, repurposing, but we'll see. We'll see. Charlie Plosser. Thank you, John. Great, interesting, fascinating paper, Steve. Um, I am going to sort of take another dimension to see what your reaction is. You know, Gary Becker taught us a lot about the home production function and how if we want to think about total welfare, we need to think about home production in a, in a different way. So given the reallocation of time that all this may involve, how do you think welfare, at, including home production, might be changed, either its productivity or its quantity of output in some sense? Just curious which direction that's going to go. Yeah, well, we, we have another short little piece that, go, that goes a takes a first stab at that. We basically, it, it's based on our survey and we ask people, how are, you, how are you using the time that was freed up by not commuting? Okay, so this is kind of like a first pass cut at this question. And their answers basically boil down to one third of it I spend on my primary job, the one I get paid for. One third of it is extra household chores, including time with kids. And one third is extra leisure. So, um, you know, so that's at least a, directional um, response to your question. Uh, but, you know, there'd be value in writing down a full-blown home production model, trying to calibrate it, um, and generating some welfare consequences uh, from it. We think, um, we think our survey data provides inputs that would be quite useful in that, that kind of exercise. By the way, I want to say that we are, we are making our micro data available to all comers. Um, we're, <laughs> We're about, to, we're about to put up a website. I don't think we've quite, quite got it in production yet, but it's going to include uh, all the micro data and we'll keep expanding it uh, every month. So um, if you've got students who are interested in some of these issues and then by all means and point them, point them towards, towards our data. John Cochran, go ahead, John. For countervailing effects, um, uh, if, uh, if, if you're going to go into the office three days a week, then that company can afford to hire more people. We talked a little bit about that. That should bring people back. Uh, if commute times, if you don't have to, if you only have to go in three days a week, then you're going to choose to move farther away. So people, people choose how much they commute, and they might choose more. And there's also in this desire to stay home, there is this sudden sharp and worrying decline of cities. Um, San Francisco and New York are particularly bad about this. There, you know, the, the crime, homelessness, uh, businesses are now leaving. So the whole nexus of people wanting to live in the cities seems to be falling apart. A lot of wanting to stay home is, is wanting to move out of the cities as well. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And you know, I, I live in downtown Chicago and it's quite clear when you walk around and nowadays in the parts of downtown Chicago, they're kind of mixed, mixed use, what Pete Wilson was describing, where there's a mix of, of high rise residences and commercial facilities, those, those parts are okay. The parts of Chicago that were predominantly commercial um, before the pandemic, they're like ghost towns. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I would not walk around in the evening. I even feel a little, a little wary about walking around in those, some of those areas of downtown Chicago in the middle of the day. Um, so it, it's back to the importance of repurposing space to make cities attractive, viable places, and some parts aren't right now. It's not just repurposing space, it's sort of basic civic governance. And to your point, many people, more people may move out of the city, and instead of a five minute walk, may be back into commuting. Uh, even Palo Alto is now overrun with homeless people that our city refuses to move along. And we're closing down stores because there's a wave of shoplifting that the, uh, that the police won't do anything about, stores won't do anything about, so they just close it down. And once it becomes a wasteland, uh, who wants to live there anymore? 
Yeah, well, that that kind of governance problem uh, can lead to a, a, a negative downward spiral very quickly, and I, I worry I worry a lot about that. And it's partly it's partly an issue of just governance quality or or political will. I yeah. maybe in the case of Palo Alto. Jonathan Burke has a question. Jonathan. You know, I you know I I'm a surprise at this group how tame they've been in letting you. Uh, and not giving you any pushback. So I'm going to give you some pushback. <laughs> Look, I mean, you could have worked from home before the, the pandemic. And there were lots of organizations that tried it and then pulled back. You know, the simple thing that, oh, it's a tough, tough experiment. Okay, maybe for Morgan Stanley, but there were companies that did experiment. So if, if, you're, if you're claiming you're making it, it's going to be an 8% increase. That's a very, very large increase. So, okay, I appreciate the pushback, but, but I think we've anticipated some of that and got responses to it. So first, I showed you evidence that people's expectations were biased on average. You can, that's what the survey data says. And what that means is they were, there were a lot of people who, and organizations, I presume as well, who were not conducting experiments that ex post turned out to be good news. That's the first point. Second point is, you as an individual or as an individual organization could experiment before the pandemic. But if you're a law firm and you wanted to see, how's it gonna work out when I work from home? Work, having my staff work from home when all my clients are working from home is a very different experience, both in terms of production and in terms of what you learn about the viability of working from home than if you try to do it on your own before the pandemic. So I think, Part of this is about the scale of the, of the experiment uh, that kind of overcame an informational inertia, these biased expectations. But part of it is it wasn't really feasible to learn what it would be like for say a large professional services organization to work from home with clients who are working from home in the pre-COVID economy. Now they, they've learned. And they've learned that some aspects of it work well, not, not all aspects, but some aspects work well. And uh, so I think those two aspects of our data go a considerable distance towards addressing your, your um, usual economic, economist critique with, if this is so good, why weren't we doing it before? <laughs> so so I think, I think we've, we've tried to address that and at least gone part way towards addressing it. So uh, I think we're just about out of time. I see Tom Stevenson's raising his finger. Tom, you have a quick question? I, I do. The, it's a technology question. One of the things we learned as we've studied uh, what's going on in K-12 education is the challenges that, uh, that are faced in terms of uh, the lack of access on the part, particularly in uh, in uh, poor areas to the technology to facilitate remote learning. And I'm just wondering whether that same phenomena is repeating itself in the, in the workplace or are the kinds of, uh, of jobs that are dependent on technology simply not part of what you're looking at? No, it, it is. And I didn't, again, another thing I didn't get a chance to talk about, but um, in our data, we see two patterns for the people who say they are really unproductive at home. There's two things that strike out among those people. One is they have lousy internet connections, exactly to your point. Um, the other is they have young kids at home. And that's also, you know, somewhat to, to the schooling thing. You know, if, if we get kids back in school, uh, then parents can work more productively at home. Uh, so, so there is a role for, for I think, investments in public infrastructure to ensure that there's more, more broad access, more near universal access to high quality internet connections, uh, both for kids who are gonna be learning remotely, but also from their parents who are working remotely. We have to stop, uh, we're at 1.15 uh, Pacific time. And uh, this is incredibly illuminating. I, I love the data and the survey. So thanks for making it available to, for, to all of us. I'm sure we'll use it. That's the most important thing. And uh, but thank, uh, thank the three of you very much. And uh, thanks for everybody to participate in these great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to have repeat questions, but uh, we'll send the questions around to everybody afterwards. So thank you so much. Appreciate it.